Since Go 1.22 was released, the net slash HTTP package is now all you need. But knowing how to use the HTTP serve mux type can be rather elusive, especially for advanced features such as middleware, subrouting, path parameters, HTTP methods, and passing through context. So in this video, we're going to look at how to implement each of these using only the Go standard library. The first implementation we're going to look at is path parameters. To add a path parameter to a route is pretty similar to other frameworks, such as Gorilla Mux or Chi, and involves wrapping the path component you want to parameterize in braces with the name of the parameter inside. In this example, we've added the path parameter of ID to our slash item path. With our parameter defined, we can then pull this out inside of our handler by using the path value method of the request type. If we run this code and send up the following requests, our endpoint is now returning the last path component to us, which is what's being captured in the ID path parameter. One thing to note, however, is that in order to have access to path parameters, you'll need to make sure you're using Go 1.22 and that you have Go 1.22 specified in your Go mod file. Any earlier versions won't have access to this feature. Whilst setting up path parameters is rather simple, there is one caveat to be aware of. That caveat is conflicting paths and precedents. For example, here I have two routes that conflict with one another. Despite this, however, if I send a request to the path ending in slash latest, it'll still be routed to the correct handler, even though both of the registered paths match. This works because Go determines which path is correct based on a precedence ordering of most specific wins. In our case, that's the path that ends in slash latest. In rare cases, however, it's difficult for Go to determine which is the more specific path. Take the following two paths as an example. If I sent up a request to slash posts slash latest, which one would resolve? In this case, they're both as specific as each other, each having one path parameter. If we try and run this code, however, Go will detect the conflict and panic when we try to register our paths. Ultimately, this is a good thing, as it prevents any requests being routed to the wrong handler. The next feature for advanced HTTP routing is the ability to easily handle different HTTP methods. Before version 1.22, this was done by having to perform a check on the request inside of the HTTP handler. Whilst it worked, it was pretty tedious. Now, however, it's pretty easy. All we have to do is define the method at the start of the matcher string. By adding the post method to the start of the path, the create monster handler will only be invoked for requests that contain a post method. Method-based routing can also be set up for the other HTTP methods, such as put, get, delete, patch, and options. If a path has no explicit method defined, then it will handle any methods that haven't been explicitly defined for that path. For example, here I have two entries to the slash monster slash ID endpoint. The first is set up to explicitly handle a put request. However, the second has no explicit method defined and therefore will be routed to for any HTTP method that isn't a put. In this example, you can see the handler is being called for get, post, delete, and even patch. In order to limit an endpoint to a method, you'll need to explicitly define it. Now, when we send up any requests that aren't a get method, we'll receive a response of method not allowed. One thing to be aware of is that when defining a method for your path, it requires a single space after it. Anything more than a single space will cause the route to no longer match. As was the case with path parameters, method-based routing also requires 1.22 to be specified inside of the project's Go mod file. If an earlier version of Go is specified, then your expected endpoints will return a 404. The next advanced routing feature is to perform handling based on a host name, rather than just a path. We can achieve this by passing in the host domain that we want the router to handle on. In my case, I'm setting this to be dreamsofcode.foo, which will handle any requests sent to that host. We can test this locally with curl by passing in the host header. However, we can also make this a little more real world by using an actual domain. But where to get one for an affordable price? That's where the sponsor of this video can help us, porkbun.com. Whether you need a domain to showcase your latest app that will change the world, or you just wanna be the developer that ships, Porkbun has you covered. Porkbun offers TLDs that are perfect for software development projects, such as .app, .dev, and my personal favorite, .foo. The best part is through this video's referral link, you can get one of these domains for just $5 for the first year, which is pretty much unheard of in this economy.
For this project, I registered the dreamsofcode.foo domain with Porkbun, and by using Porkbun's intuitive UI, I've easily managed to point the A records to the VPS server that I'm running my app on. Not only are these TLDs affordable, but they're also secure, as each requires HTTPS in order to load. Porkbun again has us covered, as they provide a free Let's Encrypt SSL cert with every domain name registration. Perfect for when you want to ship quickly, without worrying about infrastructure. We can add TLS by first copying over the SSL bundle to our server, followed by extracting the archive. Then you'll want to copy over the domain cert and the private key into your project directory. Afterwards, we can open up our main.go file and add in the following lines to create a TLS configuration from the certificate and private key. We can then use this configuration with our server, followed by telling it to listen with TLS. Lastly, make sure to change the port to 443. Now, if we build and run our API, we should be able to hit it at its domain using HTTPS. Great for getting started. In production, you'll probably want to automate the generation of SSL certs using something like CertBot. Let me know if you want to see a video on that in the future. Whilst this app likely won't change the world, we have managed to ship it with TLS enabled by using only the standard library and a little help from Porkbun. So to get your own domain for $5, use the promo code appdevfoo5 or click the link in the description down below. A big thank you to Porkbun for sponsoring this video. The next feature is actually the one that was most requested in my video about Go's 1.22 release. This feature was middleware and how to add it with HTTP serve mux. On initial thoughts, it may seem that this feature is lacking, but this is where the beauty of the net slash HTTP package really shines. Let's look at how to do this by first adding in a simple logging middleware. To do so, let's first create a new function that accepts an HTTP handler as its parameter and returns an HTTP handler as its result. The HTTP handler type is actually an interface in the standard library, which describes any type that has the function serve HTTP. These are the building blocks of HTTP routing when it comes to Go. Inside of our middleware function, we can then return a new HTTP handler func. This type allows us to easily wrap a closure, conforming it to the HTTP handler interface. The code inside of this closure is what makes up the middleware logic and will be called for each request. Inside, let's add a new variable to capture the start time of the request being handled. Then we'll pass the request and response down the chain by calling the serve HTTP method of the next handler. Afterwards, we can then call the log.println function, passing in the request method, the request path, and the amount of time that has passed since the start timestamp. This wraps up our actual middleware function. Now we need to add it into our routing stack. To do so, let's head on over to where our router is defined, inside of main.go. Then, in order to use our logging middleware, we first need to import the middleware package. Now we're ready to add logging to each of our defined paths. As the HTTP serve mux router conforms to the HTTP handler interface, then we can pass it as the argument to our middleware function. This essentially creates a new router that is wrapped in the logging middleware. Now, when we run this code and send up a couple of requests using curl, we can see that each of these are logged to the server's standard out, which prints the method, path, and time it took for the request to be handled. One improvement we can make is to also log the HTTP status of the response as well. However, if we try to do this, we run into an issue. The response writer type doesn't provide us a method to read the HTTP status code. Fortunately, because this is an interface, there is a way to expose it. Inside of our middleware package, we can create a new type called a wrapped writer, which itself extends an HTTP response writer, but also contains a status code property. We can then implement the write header method in order to intercept and capture the given HTTP status code. Then inside of our middleware, we can use this new type to wrap the response writer provided to our middleware handler. We'll also set the status code to be HTTP status OK. Then we'll pass this wrapped writer to our next HTTP handler. Then in our log.println function, we're able to access the status code found in the wrapped type. Now, when we test this code, we'll also see the response status code being printed to the console as well. With that, we've managed to easily add some middleware into our router. However, when building API services, you'll often use multiple when it comes to your middleware stack. As this stack starts to grow, your code will look less like Go and more like Lisp. To tidy this up, we can use something called middleware chaining, which turns our code from looking like this into this. To achieve this, let's head on over to the middleware package and first define a new type. This will be the middleware type, which is going to be a function that accepts an HTTP handler as its input and returns an HTTP handler. This is the same function definition as our logging middleware. Next, we can define the method to wrap our middleware. In our case, this is going to be called create stack. This method will accept a variadic array of middleware as its argument and return a middleware as its result. 
For the implementation of this method, let's first return our middleware closure. Then we can add the following implementation to apply each middleware in the stack. This will cause us to return the topmost middleware, which itself will nest all of the subsequent middleware underneath. Now, if we head on over to our main function, we can then refactor our previously wrapped code using this create stack function. If we go ahead and run this code, we can see that our middleware chain works as it did before, but now our code is just that little bit more readable. The next feature to implement is subrouting, which enables us to split our routing logic across multiple routers. To see how to implement this, let's first start with this example, which is a simple router that has some paths already configured to perform CRUD operations on a monster resource. Let's say we receive a ticket that specifies that this API should be versioned under a v1 path prefix. Instead of adding this prefix to each path manually, we can use another router to achieve this. To do so, we can call the handle function on our new router, passing in the v1 path prefix. In order for this to work, it needs to have the trailing slash as well. For the handler, we need to use the HTTP strip prefix function to remove the slash v1 from the path before it's sent to our next router. Now, when I run this code and send up a couple of curl requests to the slash v1 slash monsters endpoints, we can see that our requests are being handled as expected. As well as nesting paths, subrouters are also useful when it comes to middleware. For example, in this case, I have two different routers, one that's intended to be used by anybody and the other containing routes that are restricted to admins only. In order to require authorization to our admin routes, we can add the following handler to our router, wrapping the admin routes in the ensure admin middleware. If we then go ahead and test this out, we can see that our get request doesn't require an admin credential, but our post requests do. The last feature I want to look at is how to pass data down through your routing stack. For example, let's say we have an is authenticated middleware that will pull out and validate the user's information from an authorization header. Let's improve this middleware by making the user ID available to any downstream handlers. We can achieve this by making use of the context type from the context package. Normally, this type is used for cancellation in asynchronous tasks, but it also enables the ability to store arbitrary data using key values. Every HTTP request has an associated context, which we can easily extend and override. To do so, let's head back on over to our middleware code and first import the context package. Next, we need to define a unique key that we can use to both set and get this value from our request's context. Then scrolling down to our middleware's handler, let's first remove the log.print line and replace it with the following code. This line calls the with value method of the context package, taking in the request's context, our new key, and our user ID value. This method returns a new child context, which contains the key value pair inside. Therefore, we need to assign this new context value to our request. We can do so using the with context method, passing in our new context value. This will return a new copy of the request that contains this new context. Therefore, we need to pass this new value down to the next handler. That wraps up the implementation in our middleware. Now we need to pull the user ID out of the context in the handler function. If we navigate over to the handler where we want to pull out this user ID, we can do so by adding in the following line. Because the context.context .context stores values in a type unsafe manner, we'll need to perform a typecast by adding in the following code at the end of the line. We can verify that this typecast was okay by capturing a second return value, which is a boolean describing whether or not the cast was successful. Now if we run this code and send up a curl request with an authorization header, our handler is able to access the user ID contained due to the middleware extracting the value. With that, we've managed to implement advanced routing capabilities by only using the standard library. For some things, you may still want to consider using a third-party package. However, if you decide you want to stick with the standard library, the net slash HTTP package now has everything you need. I want to give a big thank you to my newest channel member, Eduardo Diaz. Thank you for supporting the channel and allowing me to bring my content to hundreds of thousands of viewers around the world.